Hello friends and welcome to the Architecture Enthusiast and to the 1939-1940 New York World's Fair held in Queens, New York. Many countries around the world participated in it and over 44 million people attended its exhibits in two seasons. It was the first exposition to be based on the future with an opening slogan of Dawn of a New Day and it allowed all visitors to take a look at the world of tomorrow. The fair was divided into seven geographic or thematic zones, virtually every structure erected on the fairgrounds was architecturally distinguished and many of them were experimental in many ways. Architects were encouraged by their corporate or government sponsors to be creative, energetic, and innovative. Novel building designs, materials and furnishings were the norm. Many of the zones were arranged in a semicircular pattern centered on the Wallace Harrison and Max Abramovitz Design Theme Center, which consisted of two bold white landmark monumental buildings named the Trilon which was over 700 feet tall and the Perisphere which one entered by a moving stairway and exited via a grand curved walkway named the Helicline. Inside the Perisphere was a model city of tomorrow that visitors viewed from a moving walkway high above the floor level. The zones were distinguished by many color cues including different wall colors and tints and differently colored lighting. Fairgoers walking to the north of the theme center on the Avenue of Patriots would encounter the communications and business systems exhibits. The focal point of this area was the communications building a large structure with a pair of 160-foot-high pylons flanking it. At the ATT Pavilion The Voter, a mechanized synthetic voice spoke to attendees foretelling the widespread use of electronic voices decades later. The Business Systems and Insurance Building, an L-shaped structure, housed numerous companies such as Aetna, MetLife and IBM. In particular the IBM Pavilion displayed electric typewriters and an electric calculator that used punched cards. Next door to these business exhibits on the Street of Wheels was the Masterpieces of Art building housing 300 priceless works of the old masters from the Middle Ages to 1800. The government zone was located at the east end of the fair on the eastern bank of the Flushing River it contained 21 pavilions and several smaller buildings. A centrally located court of peace, a lagoon of nations and a smaller court of states. 64 foreign governments contributed a wide diversity of creatively designed pavilions housing a myriad of cultural offerings to fairgoers. The Pavilion of Great Britain and the British Colonial Empire consisted of two buildings with a first floor connection. The copy of Magna Carta belonging to Lincoln Cathedral also left Britain in 1939 for the first time to be in the British Pavilion at the fair. Within months Britain joined World War II and it was deemed safer for it to remain in America until the end of hostilities. It therefore remained in Fort Knox next to the original copy of the American Constitution until 1947. The pavilion included a collection of stamps celebrating Roland Hill and the 100th anniversary of the postage stamp. The French Pavilion, on the Court of Peace that was the grand open space northeast of the theme center was a two-story structure whose facade featured enormous windows with majestic curves. After the fair closed and World War II ended, its French restaurant remained in New York City as Le Pavilion. The Italian pavilion attempted to fuse ancient Roman splendor with modern styles and a 200-foot-high waterfall dedicated to Guglielmo Marconi the inventor of the radio defined the pavilion's facade. The pavilion occupied 100,000 square feet of space and cost more than $3 million. The Japanese pavilion was designed by the Japanese-American architect Yasuo Matsui to resemble a traditional Shinto shrine set within a Japanese garden. The Jewish-Palestine pavilion introduced the world to the concept of a modern Jewish state which a decade later became Israel. The pavilion featured a monumental hammered copper relief sculpture on its facade titled The Scholar, The Laborer and the Tiller of the Soil by Art Deco sculptor Maurice Escalon. Netherlands Pavilion presented a comprehensive survey of the cultural importance of the three parts of the empire, Europe, the Dutch East Indies and the territories of Suriname and Curaçao in South America. The 21 countries of the Pan American Union as well as several communications companies were represented in the Pan American Union Pavilion. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Venezuela, Cuba, Mexico and Nicaragua were among the cooperating countries.
The Pan American Union pavilions at the 1939 World's Fair were an extension of Franklin D. Roosevelt's good neighbor policy which sought to redefine negative Latin American stereotypes. Each country seized the opportunity to showcase their country and to make it more appealing to those around the world especially in the United States. In their bid to increase cultural awareness at the World's Fair, the countries promoted tourism and strove to compare itself to the United States in an effort to appeal to Americans. The Polish pavilion was composed of a steel tower with gold-plated copper shields and a sandstone building with a restaurant and a round building. The Swedish pavilion, designed in the Swedish modern style by Sven Marquelius the pavilion's buildings were grouped around a central garden and included a restaurant and a cinema. The USSR pavilion was a semicircular structure with two wings partially enclosing a courtyard its designer Alexei Dushkin was awarded the grand prize of the 1939 World's Fair. The USSR pavilion's courtyard contained a statue on a pylon which was 260 feet tall. The United States Federal Building's main building was set between two 150-foot pylons, the federal building and several surrounding structures contained a combined 23 exhibits dedicated to 22 states and Puerto Rico. The food zone composed of 13 buildings in total, its focal exhibit was food court number 3. A rhomboidal structure with four shafts representing wheat stalks. The production and distribution zone was dedicated to showcasing industries that specialized in manufacturing and distribution. The focal exhibit was the consumer's building an L-shaped structure illustrated with murals by Francis Scott Bradford. Numerous individual companies hosted exhibitions in this area. There were also pavilions dedicated to a generic industry such as electrical products, industrial science, pharmaceuticals, metals and men's apparel. Perhaps the most popular of the transportation zone pavilions was the one built for General Motors which contained the 36,000 square foot Futurama exhibit designed by famed industrial designer and theater set designer, Norman Bell Geddes. The Futurama transported fair visitors over a huge diorama of a fictional section of the United States with miniature figures. Along the way visitors would encounter increasingly larger figures until they exited into a representation of a life-size city intersection. Stores in the GM Pavilion included an auto dealership and an appliance store where visitors could see the latest GM and Frigidaire products. The Ford Pavilion where race car drivers drove on a figure-eight track on the buildings relentlessly day in and day out. Not far from GM and Ford was the focal exhibit of the transportation zone. The Chrysler Exhibit Group, where an audience could watch a 3D film in a theater with air conditioning, then a new technology, of a Plymouth automobile being assembled. Other structures included in the Aviation and Marine Transport Building as well as exhibits for the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company and Goodrich Corporation. Beyond the corporate and government zones the wildly popular but less uplifting amusements area was not integrated into the thematic matrix and was classified as an area rather than a zone. Despite the high-minded educational tone that the World's Fair attempted to set the amusements area was the most popular part of the fair. William Church Osborne led an effort to construct a temple of religion a modern building for the purpose of religious assemblies and production of plays. Pageants and concerts the building included a 150-foot tower filled with stained glass windows. Olin Downs was the general director of the World's Fair Music Department and he selected Hugh Ross director of the Scola Cantorum to organize the vast series of recitals and concerts that were planned. Outdoor public lighting was at the time of a very limited and pedestrian nature perhaps consisting of simple incandescent pole lamps in a city and nothing in the country. The electrification was still relatively new and had not reached everywhere in the U.S. The fair was the first public demonstration of several lighting technologies that became common in the following decades. These technologies included the introduction of the first fluorescent light and fixture. The fair was open for two seasons from April to October each year and was officially closed permanently on October 27, 1940. To get the fair's budget overruns under control before the 1940 season and to augment gate revenues a much greater emphasis was placed on the amusement features and less on the educational and uplifting exhibits. 
The Great Fair attracted over 45 million visitors and generated roughly $48 million in revenue. Since the Fair Corporation had invested $67 million in addition to nearly $100 million from other sources it was a financial failure and the corporation declared bankruptcy. All in all, the 1939 World's Fair made a strong impression on attendees and influenced a generation of Americans. Later generations have attempted to recapture the impression it made in fictional and artistic treatments.